Greetings, everyone. Uh, we're finally here. Uh, it's been an ordeal, but uh, we're not even sure what exactly hap was happening, but we are finally here, so welcome. Uh, I'm Britton Trice with Garden District Bookshop, and it's my pleasure to welcome everyone, and especially to welcome Bill Lofelm, who is gonna be our interviewer today with Chuck. And uh, I don't think Chuck needs a whole lot of introduction, but we're here to celebrate the publication of uh, his new book. And uh, but just to add, we have mailed everybody's book, uh, except I think a couple people who registered today. Uh, and those books should go out tomorrow, but everyone else's book is in the mail. And um, what else? And we have already chosen the winners. We haven't notified everybody yet. Uh, we will send emails out to all the winners and maybe later on if we have time, uh, I, can, I will read the list of winners. Uh, if people are interested. I know Raina says she's been getting a lot of requests to see who actually has won the swag. Um, so anyway, um, for those of you who don't know, Bill Lofelm is a, one of our prime local authors here in New Orleans. Bill's originally from New York, but he has written a wonderful series of mystery books uh, set here in New Orleans, of which uh, The Devil's Muse is his most recent. Uh, he's got a great character who is a uh, Pryor was a bartender in New York and moved down to New Orleans and joined the, the police force. Uh, and so his main character is a great character, uh, com complected and uh, racy and got a wild streak, uh, but really fun to follow. Um, so anyway, Bill, welcome to, the, to our Zoom meeting today. Thank you, I'm happy to be back. <laughs> Good. Good. Second round. I'm glad we got it all up. Yeah, this, this uh, new strange times we're having. Uh, instead of having Chuck, you know, at the store like we have in the past, well, here we are in Zoom, but at least we're, we're meeting together. And uh, Chuck, thank you for doing this with us. Uh, <laughs> one quick thing. I see, well, I see most people have already, kn already know, because we already have 57 comments in the chat room. But uh, we will be taking uh, questions at the end of, uh, after Chuck reads his short story later on. We'll be taking questions from the chat room. So if anybody has questions, please enter them in the chat room and we will get to as many as we can. So anyway, without further ado, welcome everybody and Chuck, let's take it over. Bill, so. Yes. What's up, Chuck? You are a tiny little, oh, here you are. Okay, good <laughs> to see you. Uh, it's, it's a little dark in here too, so. I think my feed's a little dim. I, uh, that was such an ordeal. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I need a drink. Uh, How do you not already have one? <laughs> Just coffee, unfortunately. <laughs> All right, Bill, I trust, I, I'm going to trust you to kind of take us somewhere, please. Okay, do you want to read the story? First, no, we, we, no, no the story, at even... the end. The story is uh, definitely a sundown bedtime campfire story. Yeah, okay. Uh, not if you're planning on going right to sleep. So, all right. Well, to kick things off, the, one of the first things that occurred to me, I mean, one of your, the books divided really between the, the two main characters, uh, Foster and Mitzi, and Mitzi is a Foley artist. And First of all, I read about 50 pages of the book and it immediately changed the way I watched uh, movies and television. Like I was halfway through the book and my wife and I started watching Jurassic Park and I couldn't stop listening to like, not just the roar of the dinosaurs, but uh, the truck tires in the mud and the rain and a lot of that movie happens in the rain. And it just couldn't stop thinking about where all those sounds come from and where people get the idea to to make them. So what came first for you when you decided to write this book? Did you, the idea of someone who works on horror movies or just the concept of sound? Because you talk about more than just this, the sound in, in movies. You know, uh, the concept is even more basic than that. Uh, and it's something that I always think of as uh, tableau horror. Uh, tableau, like a still uh, 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 composition of, of things. People used to make tableaus where they would all pose in a kind of classical way. But in tableau horror, think about the movie Seven. Think about the book The Alienist or the book Da Vinci Code. 
where we never actually see the murder committed. We always see the aftermath. We always see the crime scene. We see the tableau, the static result of the violence. And in a way, Fight Club was a little bit of tableau horror because when the guy went to work, he would have all the beaten up face that was basically evidence of violence. It was witnessing violence, testifying to violence, but it wasn't actually showing people the violence. And so in tableau horror, which is what most horror is, you don't see the horror happen. You see the horror in the after effect and you see the horror talked about in this very detached forensic way. And so rather than do tableau horror where you're just happening upon the carefully arranged murder of a child prostitute, which is the alienist, is a series of murdered children prostitutes that are arranged in Jack the Ripper fashion or Da Vinci Code, which is basically clergy murdered and arranged in a very ritualistic way. I wanted to do audio tableau horror where the scream, the last moments of the person's life would be an audio tableau implying the violence. And that's been used in Clute, the movie Clute, where as Jane Fonda is being menaced at the end by the murderer, the murderer brings out a tape recorder of the scream of her, a friend of hers that he murdered previously. And that is sort of the ultimate witnessing, testifying of the violence. And also in the movie Alien, uh, the, you remember the first movie with uh, Sigourney Weaver, Veronica Cartwright? Oh yeah. We don't see Veronica Cartwright murdered. We hear her murdered, killed by the alien through Sigourney Weaver's headset. We hear that long jagged scream that suddenly cuts off. And so using an audio tableau to imply the violence is what I wanted to do again, but do it as a kind of commodified product. So it wasn't so special. It was something that, that was very ordinary. It was bought and sold. So that was the idea. Okay. In, in the book, you have um, Mitzi collects bids on the, on the screens that she's able to, to create. Um, is that something that really happens in Hollywood? No, I, okay. I made it up. I, mean, I don't know. But, but there are really uh, incredibly classic screams that I do cite throughout the book, which are screams that people now insert in video games and movies and television as almost kind of an industry joke to put the Wilhelm scream somewhere in your movie or the Howie scream. And so a movie kind of isn't an insider movie unless you've somehow used the Wilhelm scream in some uh, self-conscious ironic way. <laughs> so the tableau horror thing, um, was that instrumental in your creation of Foster? Because he is very much, we very much meet him in the aftermath of the big tragedy or the big act of violence that been, that's been perpetuated against him. You know, he's basically living out the scream that comes after, um, I, don't, I hope I'm not being, well, I don't want to be spoilery, but something terrible happens to him years before the setting of the book. And it, it, he's basically living out this long scream after that. You know, and that kind of takes us to another aspect of the story. And that is how attached we are to the sound of the voices of people we love. And I was really moved when I heard that people who got voicemails from their loved ones who were trapped in the Twin Towers or were trapped on those planes that were doomed to crash, uh, they kept those voicemails and they, they recorded those voicemails in every way possible so they would always have those voicemails of the last moment of their loved one's life. And when my mother died of cancer in 2009, I found myself that every 100 days I would hit nine to keep her voicemails for another 100 days. And so three times a year, I would hit nine instead of hitting seven to erase them. And I told a friend and she completely dissembled. And she said, my best friend died 10 years ago. And for 10 years, I had been hitting nine 
to keep the sound of her voice in my life. And so we are so attached to the, to the recordings of the voices of people we loved who are dead. And we recognize them so readily that that really is the key to Foster's character. Well, I think that in this day and age, that's even a bigger issue with the idea of everybody, almost everybody has a digital personality that continues on. Um, like early last week, a guy I went to college with dropped dead on his kitchen floor on Monday morning. And uh -huh. so yet, you know, there is this, his Facebook page is still there with all these pictures and videos and memories. And so there is this even greater long tail um, of someone's ghost almost uh, remaining behind. So the, the, the stuff about your mom and your friend makes me think of um, grief, which is another um, driving force in the book. And the way, you know, you talk about the way the screams are and the last moments of people's lives are commodified. Foster's grief is weaponized against him. And yeah, don't give too much away there because you're really right. in dangerous territory. I'll stop there. <laughs> is, is that something you wanted to, co to comment on? I mean... And that was the last thing I realized about the book. That's the thing that made the entire book gel for me. And that was the kind of miraculous reveal that I had no idea was, was in the works. I never knew that Tyler and the narrator were the same person in Fight Club. Uh, that unless the book ultimately surprises me at the end, then I know the book's not done and I know the book won't surprise anybody else. So do you, you, do you wait for that surprise? Is, is that how you know you're done? Yeah, it's otherwise, you know, the baby is still cooking. You know, <laughs> it, you're still pregnant unless that, that happens. So do you ever have an idea of the ending and then the surprise is how you're going to get there? No. Is, no? No, you know, I, I know how the mechanical ending, I know how the, the end of the second act will be. I okay. know that someone will be revealed. I knew that uh, Foster would recognize his, uh, his daughter's voice used in a movie, but that only starts the discovery process. And so really I only know up to the, maybe the end of the second act. Okay. Um, I'm, one last thing um, that I have here. Can you talk about centering um, centering women in your novels? Uh, you know, I, I, I never think of the characters as male or female. They are arbitrarily either he or she or whatever, simply to differentiate them with pronouns because it's too confusing to write about two female characters together because the pronouns get confusing for me or two male characters together uh, because then the pronouns get confusing. So the only reason why my characters have a gender is so I can keep the pronouns straight in my mind. Uh, other than that, I, I really don't consider my characters gendered at all. You know, yeah. I like that answer. <laughs> that makes me happy. Um, okay, so do we wanna toss it over to questions? Do you have anything in particular about the book that you wanna talk about? Can you talk about your research for the Hollywood stuff? You know, it was more uh, uh, research into uh, sound engineering because part of my job is, as I now have to record audio books, I now have to do these satellite link ups to do uh, television or radio uh, for different markets around the world. And so I, I found myself always in audio studios. Uh, now it's podcasts. So, you know, doing the Joe Rogan thing. And there's always a kind of setup where it's just you and the sound engineer doing sound checks. And so I thought I might as well use that time and ask all these sound engineers kind of inside stories, stories about how things went wrong, stories about the industry, about the equipment, uh, uh, just stories about procedure. And that's how I kind of put together the body of information that would become what Mitzi really knows. And the insiders, you know, everybody had something interesting to tell me about uh, 
tape bleed or about some other aspect of how industry drives uh, culture. I never thought of it. I always thought that the industry followed culture, that whatever people expressed, technology was there to present that. But no, it's the other way around. It's kind of like it, we can only express what technology can express. For instance, during my childhood, television suddenly got really uh, garish, really uh, uh, clashing. And interior design became about putting turquoise next to orange or hot pink next to orange or poppy next to turquoise. It was always what they called color class chic back then. And as a child, I just assumed that that's what designers were you know, into, was putting one really bold color against another really bold color. But that wasn't the case at all. It was because color television had just come out and the colors could not be differentiated well enough in the cathode ray tube that set designers and wardrobe people on television had, on the Mike Douglas show on Disney had to put the ugliest color next to the ugliest color to differentiate them to sort of show the television audience, look, this is why you have a color television. This is why you're gonna pay $300 versus $50 for a TV is so that you can see one really ugly color next to one really ugly color because otherwise it's gonna to be too subtle for you to appreciate the difference over black and white. And so, so much of technology I found is driven by well, so much of aesthetics is driven by what the technology will allow for and what they're trying to promote at the time in getting people to buy a new technology. Uh, same with radio. Trumpets. Trumpets record like shit on a carbon button microphone. So with a carbon button microphone, you need a coronet or you need a saxophone. And that's why in the 1920s and 30s, coronets, saxophones came into being. And that's why also crooning, like Bing Crosby sang, crooning came across a carbon button microphone perfectly because it had a very limited spectrum of sort of tonal range where it didn't go too high or too low because with a carbon button microphone, you couldn't get the highs and lows. Um, they would just go to static. And so technology drove how people sang, what instruments they could play. And so uh, across time, I was always surprised by engineers, just how technology drives what we see and what we hear, as opposed to what artists are actually creating. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I had it. So television basically is responsible for the 70s. This whole 70s. For the look of the 70s, yeah. All right, I'm gonna um, start popping up some questions. Uh, everybody, I'm gonna do the best I can to maybe like consolidate several questions into one and uh, just try and get to as many um, questions as we can. Somebody asked about um, inherited trauma, which is part of this book, and the possibility or the concept of inherited ideology. Um, can you talk to that or at least your, your interest in inherited trauma and, and what you learned about that writing this book? You know, I'm not sure about inherited trauma, but I'm really more and more aware of a kind of suppressed trauma. And most of my books are about people who have this enormous blind spot about their true nature. They are totally unaware of this enormous aspect of what has shaped them until typically the end of the book or the third act. They don't know they have a split personality. They don't know this huge true thing that has, you know, has always been there. And that's part of the discovery. And in my life, uh, I, I just find that's always the case that in a way writing allows me to kind of recognize these big horrible things that I've, I, my body hasn't forgotten, but my, my cognitive mind forgot decades ago. Do you, um, 
That's right. So uh, when, you, when you write about those kinds of things, you often, um, I mean, you seem very intentionally to challenge the readers uh, and to make them. <laughs> Somebody just asked about the penguin. This was made by a mortician and she gave it to me on tour in 2016. I don't think it was still a mortician. Is this you? Ah, <laughs> I still have the penguin. It sits on my sofa, as does this. The things you own end up owning you. <laughs> so yeah, I keep all this stuff. Thank you. It's too true. Um, where are we going? Oh, so you have um, your your style, the transgressive fiction, is a real. I'm not. A mystic. You are not a beautiful and unique snowflake. <laughs> Someone with a wood router made this. It's wood. Please, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Um, actually, which leads us to one. Um, what's up with the painting behind you? Uh, the painting is from a thrift store and it's hung upside down, uh, kind of in homage to Seven, the movie Seven, when they realize the abstract painting is hung, hung upside down. So yeah, 30 Do bucks. Do you have anything hidden behind that painting? No. <laughs> okay, good. Good. That's the right answer. Um, so um, your, your work does a real unique balancing act where you really challenge your, your reader with your subject matter. And yet, you know, as a writer, you want people to read your books. You need to attract an audience. How do you balance those two things? I, I challenge your second assumption. Uh, okay. Because I, I never feel like I should be pandering to the audience. Uh, you know, that's, that's never been my case. I, I gave up on that a long time ago. Uh, in a way, I want to give the audience something that they, that they don't want, that they don't like. And so often when people reviewed Fight Club when it came out as a book, they would say how they read it to a certain point and then they threw it across the room and then they threw it away. But ultimately they had to pull the sofa out and get the book and go back to read it. Because I think so often the books that stay with us or the movies that stay with us are not things that we can readily consume. And it's that nature that the difficulty to assimilate the book that makes it stay in your life longer and also drives you to approach other people and say, have you read this? Have you seen this? Will you listen to Guts? I need to talk about it. And so it's not about being readily sort of accepted or attracting people. Uh, if anything, I think I kind of work to drive people away. <laughs> well, and I think that's true of, of, I mean, of books, of albums, of movies, and that, I mean, I can think of any number of pieces of art that, especially from some of my favorite artists, where the first time I listen to an album, I'm like, what are you doing? What is this? Uh, and yet you go back, you know, maybe there's a song or two songs that you like and you keep getting pulled back to it, you know, and five years later, it's, you know, you're posting it on Twitter as one of your top five albums. And I think that's true of movies and, and books too. That acquired taste uh, that, you know, the first time you smoke a cigarette, you hate it. <laughs> but five cigarettes later, you, you, you're stuck. I was thinking of Octung Baby, but we can go with cigarettes. Um, Octung Baby, what is that? That was um, in 1991. That was U2's big um, reinvention album. In between, like Joshua Tree, and Red, where they changed their look, they changed their sound, they changed almost everything they did. Um, and a lot of people, were, you know, who were waiting for the Joshua Tree Part Two, were pretty disturbed that they didn't get it. And so I think that's just kind of an example of what you're talking about is that as an artist, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm going to put out there and you can kind of take it or leave it. Uh, could I digress with Faulkner? Can, can you talk about Faulkner any other way? Well, uh, <laughs> my, my career editor at Random House 
his father-in-law is the editor who kind of discovered and brought Faulkner out of, of, out of obscurity because when Faulkner died, his books were entirely out of print and people had forgot about Faulkner. And this editor looked at them all and realized that there really was a fictional universe there. And he went to his bosses and said, I'd like to republish all of Faulkner, bring it out as collections and sort of bring it to a, a greater scrutiny. And everyone said, no, Faulkner, no, he's forgotten. No one will ever read Faulkner again. So this editor started to publish uh, in major magazines, these kind of think piece articles under pseudonyms saying, hey, maybe Faulkner needs a second look. Maybe Faulkner, maybe he created more of a universe than we gave him credit for. And so this editor writing under a bunch of different pseudonyms got all these think pieces, got all these people in New York talking about Faulkner again. And then the editor's bosses came to him and said, you know, there's this big buzz about Faulkner needing a second look. And that's how my editor's father-in-law was able to bring Faulkner back and make Faulkner an institution at that point, where before he'd been completely forgotten. And so, you know, a lot of times it just takes that, that, that Fitzgerald idea that you write for the young people of your generation you write for the academics of the next generation, and you write for the critics of the generation beyond that. Uh, and that's how you become a classic. Well, did Fitzgerald undergo a similar process, right? I and, mean, when he died, he was out of print. Gatsby was a flop. And do you know how Gatsby came back? I thought it was ac academia. No, it, was, it was so lame. <laughs> um, oh, his best friend. Uh, uh, Wilson, the editor, wanted to publish. What's that? Edmund, Edmund Wilson? Yes. Wanted to publish the unfinished Loves of the Last Tycoon, but it wasn't long enough to fill a whole folio. So he needed some fluff material to fill a certain number of pages. And so he looked at all of Fitzgerald's published work to see what would fill the remaining pages of Loves of the Last Tycoon. And the great Gatsby just happened to have the perfect number of pages to finish a folio. And so Gatsby got slapped onto the back of Tycoon. And that's how Gatsby was reintroduced and became the sensation that we know today. It was just complete arbitrary accident. I mean, that's, that's crazy. Or, or it's just, it's proof that, that greatness will find a way, you know, or good art will find it, will find an audience one way or another. So speaking of, I'm getting a lot of questions about um, book three of the Damned trilogy. Mm. And will we see that anytime soon or what's up with that? Uh, two words, train wreck. <laughs> Number one, if a book doesn't sell enough copies, the publisher will not allow you to do another sequel. Yeah. And so, yeah, that happened with Rant, that happened with Damned, it happened with Doomed. And so it's, it's become this kind of uh, dance to try to get the third book of, of, of Damned out. And so if you read Fight Club 3, you can see what I'm doing. I'm kind of merging the mythology of Fight Club and the mythology of Damned. And suddenly my artist, Cameron Stewart, this fantastically gifted guy gets cancel cultured. So Cameron Stewart, my go-to artist gets cancel cultured. So I'm not sure what's gonna happen there, but basically Fight Club 4 is gonna be the completion of the damned trilogy as a graphic novel and if i can do it with cameron i'll do it with cameron if i can get joelle jones who's just a she is just a god of illustration her her work is is glorious uh, i've seen her work tattooed on so many people <laughs> if we can get joelle jones or cameron or whoever but fightful four 
will complete the damn trilogy. So where can your audience find themselves in Joel Jones? Just look up Joel Jones. Oh my gosh. Uh, she yeah, has her own dumb question. Just Google it. Yeah. She's got a great series. I think it was called uh, lady killer or beauty killer about a 1960s housewife who is gorgeous and is uh, hired by the government to uh, work as an assassin. It's really smart and it's done in the style of fashion illustration from that time. So everything is very elongated and very stylized. Uh, and, and Joelle is brilliant. Do you, who, who else are you into right now? What are you reading? What are you uh, listening to? Uh, What's inspiring you these days? You know, a lot of people have been sending me poetry books. And they've been kind of saving my life because they are uh, reinventing the way that I think about writing prose. And so some of them are, are much better than others, but uh, they're all forcing me to kind of look at prose in terms of poetry. Um, that's really saving my life. Yeah. All right. Do you have, um, what other, do you have any other film or TV projects in the pipeline? Ah. Something for us to be excited about. Oh boy. We just started meetings for Fight Club on Broadway and uh, which is gonna be a seven year process, they tell me. It takes seven years to get it together, to open it out of town, to get the kinks out of it, to find the right theater in New York and to finally open it on Broadway the best case scenario will be seven years from now. Wow. Yeah. And uh, Survivor's option for a television series, Invisible Monsters is being developed as a, a streaming television series. Uh, Rant is being developed as a streaming television series. Some people are trying to get Haunted, uh, which was bought for a movie. The movie hasn't been made. And so it looks like uh, Haunted might be going for a, a television series as well. Oh, what else? Uh, yeah, Fight Club. Fight Club were approached about an adult, uh, an adult animated series, because it's one of the, the few things that can be produced right now during the COVID lockdown. Right. That makes sense. And uh, also scripted podcast. I've been asked to create a scripted podcast because those can be created under COVID lockdown. So basically they, a, a radio show, like the chat. Exactly, chefs. yes. So we're, we're all going we're back all to, <laughs> it's like the shadow nose and inner sanctum. Um, uh, all right, so, um, so you, several of your books deal with mass fatality events. Um, do you think the kind of slow rolling disaster of COVID is going to change the, the meaning of this or the reader experience when you write about it? Or, or I mean, this is kind of a new thing for all of us. A new thing for you? You know, don't, uh, don't think it's a new thing for me. I lived through the 80s. I so lived through I. AIDS. I lived through, you know, how many of my friends are dead today? So do you, you know, parallels? I, I see that COVID is lightweight compared to going to three or four memorial services and funerals every week uh, and when working in hospices and the kind of demonstrations and the kind of political turmoil around resolving AIDS. Uh, AIDS was this enormous you know, storm of grief that could not be resolved. And so in a way, COVID is AIDS light. Uh, so yeah, COVID seems very tame compared to uh, how my 20s were completely fucked up with AIDS. Do you, why do you think that is? Do you think, Because uh, with AIDS, people died in the open and they died in the streets 
and they lived their lives uh, walking among people because they weren't as readily contagious and there wasn't a lockdown. So you really saw people dying of AIDS at the supermarket and uh, you did what you could to, to bring them food and you took care of their pets and you uh, arranged housing for them. And there were people you knew and there were people who were your age and there were so many of them. In a way, Invisible Monsters is very, is very much my AIDS book. Can you talk a little more about that? Because during the, the, the really, you know, gruesome days of AIDS, everybody kind of knew who had AIDS. And so it was kind of whispered. And so people might look totally normal and totally attractive, but everyone knew that that person had AIDS. So they were in a way an invisible monster. And in a way, each person with AIDS had to kind of at the end, accept the fact that they had put themselves more or less into the circumstance that, that gave them AIDS. They had to take some responsibility for it. That was the only way of achieving some closure. And that's what the, the character does at the end of Invisible Monsters is a kind of very literal, I did this to myself, because that's the only way of achieving any kind of closure uh, and, and giving up being angry. Have you, have you ever come up against something um, in your research that was a, a step too far. I mean, you, you talk a lot about pushing boundaries and challenging people and, and, and you're like, you know what, I'm going to stop here. I'm not going to include that in my book. I'm not going to go any further um, with this subject. I mean, I guess, I guess my question is how hard do you challenge yourself to address uncomfortable subject matter before you bring it to an audience? <sighs> That is a tough one because I can almost always find a way in to a really dark topic. But I was warned really early on, uh, avoid killing animals. Um, yeah, a friend of mine, and I use the term friend really loosely. She was kind of a very toxic person I went to college with. And she and her boyfriend, to pay their tuition, they would go around to people who were giving up uh, pets, going, giving up household pets. And they would pretend to be a young, happy married couple. And they would adopt these dogs and cats because it was widely known that dogs and cats who had been raised with a lot of love and a lot of support uh, were excellent for product testing and torture because they would not lash out. They wouldn't they had no sort of survival instinct. And so these friends, Janet and Steve, would go around and adopt elder elderly dogs and cats for the most part, and then sell them to product and medical testing laboratories where these animals would spend the rest of their lives in horrific suffering circumstances. And I tried to write a dark, dark romance about that. And my editor kicked it back and said, no, this is just too awful. Don't, don't go there. And then soon after I read a, uh, a story by David Foster Wallace. Uh, it was one of his most famous short stories called The Girl with Cur Curious Hair. And in it, a bunch of punks uh, acquire a puppy dog. They go into a basement they dump lighter fluid all over the puppy dog. They set it on fire and they, they scream with laughter as the dog runs around the basement and burns to death and finally falls over dead. And after reading that story, I was really soured on ever reading David Foster Wallace ever again. I so did not want to risk coming across another scene like that. The same with, uh, with uh, George Saunders. 
uh, in 10th of December, he kills a puppy. And that left such a bad taste in my mouth that I get that killing an animal is just not something to be taken lightly. Um, well, I think so. I, d I don't do it. I, th I think it can become shorthand um, for showing someone's a bad person. That, and, and there's a fine line, and I think especially in challenging material, there's a really fine line between challenge and then just being gratuitous for just the sake of, of, of shock value or look how transgressive I, you know, it's performative. It's, a, it's a, on, the, on the part of the author. I mean, yeah, one of the first storylines I tried for the Maureen Coghlan series where she's a police officer learning her way was to, um, was gonna be a dog fighting storyline. And I got absolutely nowhere with it. Um, we've always had dogs in the house and I'm like, okay, this is not something, I'm never gonna be able to go there. Um, which is, you know, it makes me real think about my relationship with violence. Um, and just, I can watch a city decimated by dragon fire with no problem. Um, but, you know, I can't watch uh, I Am Legend more than once. Because the dog dies? Yeah. And when you watch uh, American Psycho in theaters, when the homeless man is beaten to death, the audience says nothing. But when the homeless man's dog is stomped to death, the audience goes crazy. And I guess you kind of answered the next question I was going to ask yeah. you about um, violence um, and and what 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 value do you see in writing about it? About a uh, violence and. You know, for the most part, for most of my career, the violence that I've depicted is a therapeutic violence. It's like a uh, mutually agreed upon consensual structured violence. I want you to hit me as hard as you can. We're going to do this thing and it's going to be a way of testing each other's limits. And in Fight Club in particular, the story went south when, when Marla showed up with a black eye and it became apparent that the narrator had struck Marla, which was not okay. And so my violence is, is for the most part, always uh, agreed upon. It's kind of a gestalt exercise. All right, scan it, rolling through the questions here. I think we've covered a lot of it. How are we doing on time, Brenton? You know, I don't want to shortchange the story, and I want, uh, I want there to be time for people to talk about it after you've read it. Something that really uh, keeps coming back in my life is as a Catholic, when I was like 13, 12 or 13, I had to go through confirmation. And uh, the nuns told us, they said the bishop who's going to come down from Spokane, he's really old school, and he's a hitter. And during confirmation, as you go to the bishop and you accept your confirmation saint name, the bishop typically slaps you lightly on each cheek, except for the old school bishops, and they wallop you really hard back and forth. They hit you so hard, harder than most kids have ever been hit by even kids. And it was so amazing to go up there. And the, the shock is supposed to wake you up to your adulthood. That getting smacked is when you become an adult. You wake up out of childhood. When that bishop hit me, wow. I will never forget that moment. And in a moment, in a way, that moment is present all throughout Fight Club. A, a friend of mine used to be an assistant to the Dalai Lama. And the first time that they met, the Dalai Lama smacked her really hard across both cheeks, like, like bad, assault and battery hard, to wake her up to, to reality, to her life. And she will never forget that. And so there is that ritualistic aspect of being struck that, uh, that isn't destructive. It's kind of enlightening. 
And I wanted to sort of play on that as well. Well, there's certainly a clarity of mind that comes with that adrenaline rush, right? Yeah. And also, it the self is kind of suppressed that there are physiology studies that if you lose a fight, a, a, a boxing match, or you lose a wrestling match, your testosterone levels drop and your physiology drops to prevent you from going into another fight before you're fully recovered. So you do achieve a kind of peace and tranquility by being beaten. Uh, and I, I just, I love stuff like that about physiology. It's pretty, I'm, many, many years ago, I took quite a beating outside a bar in Philadelphia. And, and one of the things I remember in the midst of it was a real sense of calm and clarity being like, okay, this is happening. I have to make some decisions about what I'm going to do here. And I, I remember weird things very vividly, like the shoes everybody had on because I was on the sidewalk and they were standing around me and it was, and I'm, I'm sure my testosterone dropped after that, but that was much more of a beating than a fight. But there was that moment, that bizarre moment of almost being relaxed in, in the middle of it. And sometimes I wish I had someone in my life who I could just call up and say, I'll give you $10, come over and hit me. Hit me really hard, things are too much. Because that, that trauma is very much like electric shock therapy, which is being used more and more to break people out of depression. And it does, it is a, a big physical reset. Uh, you know, like you would reset a computer or a big refresh. Have you ever considered boxing? Or, or you know, arts or? I have, and I, I've done martial arts, I've done wrestling. Um, uh, but it's just, I want something that's like a pizza. I want somebody who can show up and just smack me across the face two or three times and I'll pay them $5 and they go away. Just a, a Domino's guy with a paddle instead of a pizza. No, just a big open hand, just a big, <laughs> I don't want bruises. I just want to have the shit smacked out of me and I'll pay more than $5. I'll pay $50. So, um, in a completely unrelated matter, how are you all doing where you're at with uh, the fires and the atmosphere? And a couple of people have asked about that after y'all's general situation. It's, you know, came, same old, same old for, for me. You know, it, if you're a writer, your life is always kind of on lockdown. You get up, you self-motivate, you do what needs to be done. Everybody else is interacting with the world and you're lucky if you get to go in the evening. Uh, and so it's, it's been more or less, you know, how I live my life most of the time. I miss tour because for me, tour was like uh, being the dog that's been in the house all day <laughs> and going out on tour was getting to throw things at people and, and giving, uh, giving out prizes and a big party. It was like a bunch of big parties strung together and then going home. And this year I don't get that. I've noticed you, you have really interactive um, reader writer events, which, which I think is a great idea. When we were at Tippy Tina's, we had more carnage than Tippy Tina's had ever seen. We had more people fainting I and bleeding. There too. What was that? I think Guar has played there. So you topped Guar. That's, yeah. not, that's not easy to do. That was a great night. Yeah. So, and it's about, you know, book events are so boring uh, that my readers have typically never been to a book event and they may never go to another book event. So it's about staging these things in such a way that they're glad and that they will talk about it and that it, will, it didn't waste their time. Oh, pajamas in Houston <laughs> at that bar with the, the dirty backyard. Do you know, I was really upset that night in Houston because my brother was diagnosed with cancer that afternoon. He was supposed to be there and he was in the hospital with this cancer. I was just a mess. Oh, 
Naperville. You said Naperville? Did you know that somebody committed suicide in the hotel that day? And that's why there were so many police in the hotel? Because they weren't sure if it was a suicide or a murder? Yep. Naperville. Oh, and Naperville got toured. It got changed this year. It was supposed to be this year. But the last time Naperville was the suicide in the hotel. And I will do Las Vegas. I got family in Las Vegas. Right. But, but Tipitina's was the crazy one, is what you're telling me. Uh, crazy in every way. And uh, Monica Drake, who read with me, she fell down on stage and she cut her leg open. And she, she was so full of adrenaline, she didn't realize she was bleeding. And she got this, the whole stage was covered in blood. And we started to slip and fall in Monica's blood. Uh, it was that kind of a literary event. Oh, my God. I think I had a cooler of beer at my last event. You know, I got <laughs> like, I got to up my game. Um, so you've, you've kind of touched on this a little bit already, but a, a couple of people have asked and have seen you say in interviews, you weave um, things from your, per, your personal life into your fiction. Um, do you come up with something and then reach back your experiences to tell that story? Or does something happen to you in real life and you just you interpret that into your, your, your work? You know, it works kind of both ways. Most recently, uh, I, I teach a workshop. And in workshop before class, we were talking about this used magazine store that was going out of business. And someone said, well, I guess all the guys who bring in all their Playboy collections are going to have to just sell them somewhere else. And somebody else said, I wonder if that's how the big box of porn in the woods happens. And the whole group went silent. Because of those 27 people ranging in age from like 18 to 65, every single one of them, as a child, had found a big box of porn in the woods. Or they found a garbage bag of porn or a duffel bag of porn, or they found it at the beach. I found mine in the desert, or the people have found them stuffed under dumpsters, uh, cardboard boxes. And so in that moment, everyone realized that their secret story had been experienced by everybody else. And they all leapt in to try to tell their story. And so what you're looking for is an event that everyone has had, but that no one has ever talked about for one reason or another. And in that moment, we all found such freedom around these, these monstrous stories of kind of shame and fear that we, we wanted to all write an anthology and publish it. And Trisha came up with the idea of calling it Children, Children of the Porn. And when we took it to publishers, Genius. they said children and porn in the same title. No. Yeah. So it never went anywhere. But my, my, my point is, you are looking for your secret experience reflected in someone else's story, or you are looking for your secret experience for someone else to engage with it and relate their own secret experience, because then you have a pattern. All right. Oh, so. I burn my notebooks when I complete a book. I burn everything. Do you really? Yeah. Have you ever regretted it? No. Huh, that's funny. Winters are really cold. So let me, do you think. It's alive. I love It's Alive. It's a good movie, too. It's alive. What kind of notebooks do you use? Uh, right now, I've gotten really classy, and I'm using uh, moleskins. Oh, yeah. nice. I'm, I'm addicted to the, the marble hardcover notebooks. I have stacks of them. Are they spiral bound or perfect bound? Uh, perfect bound. OK. And, it's, and I'm, I cannot, it has to be that. I'm like scouring, you know, and now we're becoming a more and more paperless society. 
and I'm scouring local drugstores like at the start of every school year, trying to hoard these, trying to hoard these notebooks. Because for some reason, you know, they have the magic in them. I have to agree with fuck wirebound because <laughs> when it burns, I want nothing left. <laughs> because the wires don't burn. Right. <laughs> and and for pens, it's gotta be a gel impact one millimeter blue. Uh, because then it never wears your hand out and it is uh, it's just so juicy and it's such a bold line and your handwriting always looks really fat and really good. Blue because people don't think that blue is printed in the books. This will make your handwriting look so gorgeous that if it's in black, people will think it's printed in. But in blue, they, they assume that it's not. It's actually written. All right, nice. What's the first thing you can do when you get out of quarantine, bud? Ah, uh, uh, when, when things loosen up a little. Damn. I might go to the beach, but I'll go to the beach anyway. So I'm not sure. My life is already kind of more or less quarantined. <laughs> but I do want to put together a ginormous tour with the kind of big stunts, like the big beach ball stunt that is so gorgeous in a darkened venue. And I'm working with these suppliers to get the most amazing things for a next tour that will have those big kind of performance art events. So there are a bunch of uh, writers on this, uh, in this meeting. What, what advice do you have to, to offer? I know that's a real kind of general question, but I don't know. How do you talk a lot? Of, you said you, you get up and you self-motivate. How do you do that? Uh, sometimes, especially right now, or when I'm in a hotel room and I'm traveling, I will tell myself, I am not getting out of bed until I have a, a great idea. I am not getting get out of bed until I've figured out the next thing. And so I force myself to lay there and then eventually a great idea happens. I write it down. Uh, if I'm in a hotel, I order coffee and then I sit in bed for as long as I can and keyboard and drink a big pot of coffee. Uh, yeah. Is it the same when you're stuck? You know, when I'm stuck, that means it's time to either take a shower or wash dishes or walk the dog. Walk the, walk the dog is a real good one. Just get out of there. Get away from everything and do something outside. You know, uh, Charles Dickens used to walk 20 miles a day. There's this whole culture of the, the walking poet or the walking writer where the, the most successful would hire a stenographer to walk with them and they would dictate their notes to this poor person who would stand next to them and, and walk with them and write down their ideas. But there's something about walking in a natural setting or in a city that just really helps you get past. But I, th I, th I think there's an anonymity when you step outside. I mean, you're sitting at your desk in your office and you are your whole world. And then you step outside and you're alone. You're kind of anonymous. And, you know, so maybe that has something to do with it. But I find that really breakthroughs happen when I'm really physically engaged, when I'm taking a shower and my awareness is my entire body with the presence of the water. Or when I'm washing dishes and my awareness is entirely in my hands. Or when I'm lifting weights and my awareness is entirely in my neuromuscular skeletal whatever. It's not in my head anymore that the ideas occur in these moments when my head is the least engaged thing, when my body, my physicality is engaged. That's when the breakthrough ideas happen. So you would say exercise and physical activity is critical to your writing life. Yeah. Now, last week I stacked four cords of firewood. And every summer I stack four cords of firewood and 
as it smashes my fingers and as I have to climb to the top on a ladder to get the top rows up, I always get fantastic ideas. I get fantastic ideas when I'm uh, working in stone, when I'm setting stone and I'm getting, you know, I'm going up an 11 foot ladder, a 12 foot ladder to place a 70 pound stone in just the right place. I know that that physical act will so engage my entire body that a, brilliant, a really bright idea will occur to me. Just the thing that I've been waiting for will happen in that moment of complete physical occupation. Do you, are you one of those people who wakes up with a great idea in the middle of the night? Because I am not. I wake up in the middle of the night and I think it's a great idea. And sometimes I'll even make the mistake of sending it to somebody and inevitably an email comes back with, you know what, that's not my favorite idea that you've had. But I know for other people, it can, you can dream it, you can, it can strike in the middle of the night. No, I'm with you. In the middle of the night, coming out of a dream, it seems so doable. But then the next morning, it seems so, no, not going to happen. Yeah. Which book are you most proud of? You know, in terms of uh, communicating just useful information, I'm most proud of Consider This, the writing book, because uh, I think writers kind of hoard a kind of inside information. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that that information, that kind of technique got out and it didn't just kind of die with me. Uh, so I was proud of that. But beyond that, I was really proud of, uh, of Beautiful You because my dog had died that spring. And I wanted to write a comedy about arousal addiction because I think arousal addiction is kind of destroying the lives of so many people with uh, whether it's video games or pornography or really serious drugs that, uh, that people are, are kind of addicted to this kind of heightened brain chemistry that is uh, destroying their lives. And so Beautiful You was supposed to be a comedy about arousal addiction that I don't think it was really recognized as such, but I'm still really proud of it. In a way, it's nice to be proud of the book that nobody else got. <laughs> it's, well, it's still yours in a way. I mean, you know, how, how, how often has that happened where you've had a book go out in the world and people react to it and you're like, no, 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 no. It wasn't that, it was this. Or, or do you even believe in that? I never ever dictate a, a correct meaning versus an incorrect meaning. And one of my favorite anecdotes was I was driving through the desert once in, in, in Eastern Washington state. And there was a gas station in the middle of nowhere, middle of the night, one, two o'clock in the morning. And in Oregon, you can't pump your own gas. So I pull up to the pump. There's this guy, this pump jockey, young kid, middle of nowhere in the desert. He sets his book down. He comes over, pumps my gas. He goes back. And it's my book, Invisible Monsters. And that's what this 22-year-old kid is reading at two o'clock in the morning in the middle of the Oregon desert. And part of me thought, I should tell him. I should say, let me sign your book. I wrote that book. I can tell you what that book's all about. But then I thought, no, no. That would sort of get put me between him and the book. I wanted him to just experience that book and I wanted that book to be about what he thought the book was about. I didn't want to preclude his interpretation. So, you know, I paid and I drove away. Uh, but that's kind of, that's, you know, my policy is not to preclude other people's interpretation. Have you been back to that gas station since then? No. <laughs> That was 10 years ago, at least. I have some people asking about your classes. 
and everybody wants to know what you're drinking. <laughs> there you go. So are you teaching and do you have slots available? Oh, man. When COVID is over, we will have a ton of slots available. Right now, we have been focusing on horror and ghost stories. And I've been trying to get it so that we can meet in this, uh, this historical cemetery. So we can all sit at a social distancing way and still present our work. But uh, weather is cooling off. And as soon as COVID is over, we will definitely be putting the call out for more students. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure whether the call might go out through, uh, it might go out through an organization called the, the Writers at the Attic Institute, which uh, did a lot of organizing for me a couple of years ago when I first started to, uh, to teach. Attic, so, oh, like hiding up in the attic? Right, yeah. yeah. What's your favorite book? What, what have you read that, that where you're like, man, I wish I had done that or could do that? Or, 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 or do you like books where it's something you couldn't possibly have done? Yeah. You know, and uh, Mark Richard's short story collection, The Ice at the Bottom of the World, that's always been one of my favorites. Uh, Charles Baxter's short story collection, uh, Through the Safety Net, that's a stunning book. Uh, uh, Nami Moon, a Korean-American writer, she has a book called Miles from Nowhere. And I don't know anybody who has read that book who was not completely blown away by it. Um, so I, I tend to go to short story collections. So... Uh, Miles from Nowhere, uh, Juno Diaz's collection, Drown, um, anything by Amy Hempel. Um, boy, she's got stories like uh, uh, In the Cemetery Where Al Jolson is Buried that will just leave you devastated. And you won't know how she, uh, she beat you up so badly. Uh, Excellent. So do you read when you're working? Or do you avoid it? I avoid it unless it's nonfiction and it's kind of research reading or unless it's poetry that can kind of shake up the prose in my head and, uh, and let me write in a, a much more loose, intuitive way uh, instead of writing the way Dan Rather speaks. It's always about finding a different way to sort of burn language. Does music play into that? Do you listen to music when you work? I used to. I used to listen to the same song over and over throughout each book to try to establish a continuity of mood. I do that. I have a playlist for, for everything I write. And I tend not to do that anymore. Uh, I, I'll listen to maybe uh, classical music, uh, especially French, Satie, uh, Debussy, Chopin, um, yeah. Why do you think that changed? I think because now I am, uh, I'm trying to write a little bit more conventionally. And it used to be that I could write Invisible Monsters while watching MTV and just all these different music videos were just this constant, wonderful chaos, choppiness that sort of inspired the book. And now when I'm writing something that's not overtly funny, when I'm writing something like Invention of Sound that is, a, is really a drama and horror at its center, then I can't listen to something that might be poppy or might be funny or might be angry. I have to listen to something that's just a little more uh, establishment, a little more classical. How, how has your working life changed? 
from the first couple books to the last couple books? I mean, do you still keep the same routine? Have you changed things up? I know you, you, you've always written in notebooks, but what do you, what do, you do different? Yeah, you know, uh, boy, I really don't do anything different. Uh, yeah. Um, I have a dog. It ain't broke. What's that? If it, if it ain't, ain't broke. broke. You know, I used to write in public places as much as I could, like airports and hospitals, uh, because there were places where I could be for a long time and there was no other dis distraction. There were places of discomfort. And so uh, I would go to those places, but now that I like to have my dog with me, I can't go to those places. So I, I, I'm not gonna be riding in an airport or a hospital as often. Do you, we have requests for Spotify playlists for uh, anything you remember from what, what you've worked on, if you wanna get on that. Especially for a playlist for invention of sound. Hmm. Boy, invention of sound did not have a playlist. It would have been entirely uh, classical music. <laughs> Cornflower blue. What li literary <laughs> pilgrimage is? Uh, they're just flashing up here. Oh, my dog is downstairs and she doesn't like going up the stairs. Sorry. <laughs> what kind of dog do you have? Let me see on my phone. I have a Boston Terrier. Gallery. Can you see that? There you go. What is her name? Her name is Egg, like <laughs> Easter Egg. Adorable, adorable. She is adorable. And here is Egg, laying on the sidewalk like a dead thing. <laughs> she doesn't want to walk anymore? That's a hot day. Well, look, when you're done, you're done, right? We should, we should be more like them. Chuck, how about reading that short story? All right. You ready to let it rip? Yeah, let me go to mute. So, I got to turn some lights, lighting change. So, can you hear can you hear me? Is this all right? Does he yes? Give us a thumbs up if you can hear everybody. Thank you. Okay. So the story is called The Prophecy of Ruth, and it, it is or it will be in the uh, the current issue of Cemetery Dance magazine. So, the prophecy of Ruth. Ruth squatted down and she pulled at the bottom drawer. The white paint had worn off the knobs and the old wood felt smoother than the paint, polished slippery from bare skin. Oiled by the oil off so many fingers, Ruth pulled and the wood barked. She pulled and tumbled backward on the thin rug. A knob had ripped free, showing a metal screw still sunk in the drawer front. She tossed the loose knob aside and rose to her knees. The drawer had come open a smidgen, so she wedged her fingertips into the crack and dragged it out. 
one side budged, then the other, until the drawer moaned. It slid open with the smell of paperback books found in the baking hot attic on a summer day. She saw a mouse nest first. A blizzard of black specks darted and swam over the shreds of paper, and Ruth snatched back her hands and looked and shook her fingers clean. The specks became mouse droppings and became sugar ants. But when she saw at last what they really were, silverfish, there was nothing to see but the mouse nest. And even that wasn't a nest, it was just paper. Just slips of paper filled the drawer. They filled it to the brim, folded slips of paper, hardly bigger than a fortune cookie, some with a ragged edge, some torn from yellow legal pads and, and others just white paper that had yellowed with age. Each was folded smaller and folded smaller, creased and pinched tight to make a, a little packet. Kneeling on the thin rug, Ruth picked one up and she held the packet at arm's length, no telling what, what might fall out as she picked at one loose edge and she opened it. It looked blank until she turned the paper over. Someone had written the length of the paper on the other side in black ink. Penmanship in letters as round and curling as pubic hair. Cursive, her father would call it. It was her father's handwriting in, in black ballpoint pen. Bureau, her father would call it. Ruth read, quote, November 1985, the furnace is making that noise again, unquote. She set the paper aside and stuck her hand into the drawer for another. As if she were choosing in a lottery, she dug around. Her hand swam through the folded papers, stirred them, tossed them like she would toss a salad. Her fingers closed around another and she lifted it. She shook it free of possible silverfish. She opened it. In that same round handwriting, it read, quote, September 1982, Africanized honeybees will attack this state next summer. Killer bees, he had meant. Ruth smiled to herself. She plunged her hand into the folds of paper and plucked out another. This read, Quote, April 1988, Susan is coughing again, unquote. And that same hairy handwriting. Now this one, this one hurt. He had meant his wife. He'd written this three, maybe four years before she'd been diagnosed with cancer. If he had done anything more than write this note and stash it away, Ruth's mother might be here right now helping collect his things for charity. She chose another folded secret, quote, Benny despondent, despondent, unquote, dated 1997. From, from killer bees to her brother's depression, it wasn't that her father hadn't worried about the wrong things. He hadn't worried about anything. Another slip read, June 9th, 1977. Desmond found a lump on his testicle. Whoever Desmond had been, if he'd asked her dad for advice, Ruth guessed that Desmond was probably dead. Quote, March 1998, Benny says he's going to kill himself, unquote. Her father had written these words, folded them, and socked them away like Scarlett O'Hara procrastinating her panic. Ruth plunged her hand back into this, this collection of her father's worst fears. She had Dale Carnegie to thank. Maybe Dale Carnegie didn't invent it, but he turned this into a thing. Her father had read Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence Strangers. He pressed Benny to read the book how to stop worrying and start living. In it, 
Carnegie would write his worst fears on slips of paper. He'd fold the paper and toss it into a drawer. Every year, he'd, he'd dump out the drawer and read the accumulated fears and laugh over how none of them had ever come to pass. Around the time that Harpo Marx made a cameo appearance on I Love Lucy, Dale Carnegie had died from Hodgkin's. Ruth fished another worry out from the past. This one read, Ruthie says the Pontiac smells hot as after she drives up Web Webster Hill. This one was dated August 1979. The engine had never caught fire. The, the radiator had never boiled over. Her father had squirreled away her concern and nothing had ever come to pass. Kneeling on the rug, she plucked out other false alarms. She chose the harmonic convergence of August 1987, when all the planets in the solar system were supposed to align and their combined gravitational fields would devastate mankind. She unfolded notes about the Y2K doomsday bug of 1999, the Nibiru meteor of 1995, bird flu, SARS, the global cooling of 1972, peak oil, swine flu, the 2012 Mayan day of annihilation, acid rain, ozone depletion, Africanized honeybees. She read notes about the 1974 satellite photos showing the Arctic ice sheet advancing and a new ice age beginning. She read about collapsing frog populations. Her father and, her father and Dale Carnegie weren't alone with this. No less than Joan Didion had done this same thing. Joan Didion, among the most famous writers of her generation. During the years that Didion had lived in a, a derelict mansion on Franklin Boulevard in Los Angeles, in what she wrote had been a senseless killing neighborhood, Joan Didion had written down the license plate numbers of trucks that parked outside, trucks that circled the block, suspicious trucks. Didion wrote about the notes in her essay collection, The White Album. She had put all of those license plate numbers into a drawer for the police to find after that she would someday be murdered by a stranger. And no one had ever arrived to butcher Joan Didion. That summer, that same summer, death had gone to Sharon Tate's house instead. Ruth closed both eyes and listened to the sounds of the house, the pop of a window frame warming in the sun, the wooden joint popped like her father's knuckles, the clock ticking in the, at the foot of the stairs sounded the same as the metal parts when the oven in the kitchen heated up. She sunk both hands into the folded bits of paper, scooped up years of fear, one cupped handful of terror she let spill down on the other papers, rustling papers, papers cascading over papers, dread poured upon dread, all those days and years, a jumble. She chose another, July 2017, Zika virus to destroy the entire next generation of children. She picked out, quote, June 1968, mercury and other heavy metals to wipe out all tuna stocks, unquote. Some, pap some papers her father had rolled tight like cigarettes. These had sunk to the bottom of the drawer. From among these, she enrolled May 1970, the pimple on my leg won't heal. Some notes, full pages, folded one way then the other, so they unfolded like old road maps. Paper napkins folded down to the size of postage stamps, compressed, pressed, pinched, crushed so the worry would never escape. Here was her father as a young man and an old man, pecking away on a typewriter or scribbling with a pen. In this drawer, he lived every age at the same time. The terrible handwriting of his growing up is surrendered to the terrible handwriting of his old age. All his fears, from monsters underneath the bed to the West Nile virus. They were stockpiled here. 
papers like, like little notes that kids palmed from hand to hand in grade school, origami with any loose flap tucked to stay closed, the dried ink stuck shut so long that the folds tore when her fingernails tried to pick them apart. Quote, Rosie not eating her food again, July 1974. Rosie, Rosie had been Ruth's long ago poodle. He'd written in May of 2018, quote, that boy at the supermarket asked if Ruthie is still married. On the surface, it didn't look like a problem unless her dad had left out some detail. But why, why write the note if it hadn't been a worry? Quote, boy at the supermarket asked if Ruthie still lives in town. He drove past her house for a look, unquote. This was June of 2018. Ruth laid the strips of paper next to each other, organizing them by date the oldest to the, to the most recent. She put August 1972, is Trixie on her last legs? Next to May 1982, the gypsy moth will destroy all North American hardwoods in the next five years, leading to catastrophic wildfires. Between them, she placed March 1979, acid rain to deforest the entire continent. Trixie, the Trixie he referred to had been her mom's split leaf philodendron. Ruth saw how the news media had dialed the panic up and dialed it down year by year. She jigsaw puzzled notes together looking for a pattern or just to create a pattern because even a fake understanding felt better than, than real chaos. Ruth tossed aside notes about the snowpocalypse of 1989. They piled up into, to make a white drift with the snowmageddon of 1998 and 1999 and 2003, the snowzilla of 2005. She found September 2000, right upper rear molar feels loose. Then, quote, boy at the supermarket says that they went to school together. He says he wants to touch her hair when he bags Ruthie's vodka. He double bags without her asking, but she never says thanks, unquote. Also June of 2018, then, quote, boy not working at the market. Cashier won't say why. July 2018, unquote. Then, swine flew back. Then, Ruthie's cat went missing, August 2018. Ruth pulled the drawer free of the dresser. She knelt, leaning over it, this open wooden box brimming with her father. She could picture him revisiting his old terrors and and chuckling over the horrors that had never come to pass, the meteors that, that hadn't annihilated the planet. After a lifetime of killer bees and acid rain, ozone holes and, and bird flu, why worry about the bag boy at the neighborhood price chopper? Being scared of everything had left her father afraid of nothing. She listened to the house settle around her. Clouds had cut the sunlight a wind rose as the, as the sun began to go down. In the dim light, dimmer now, she could hardly read, quote, heard a new noise in the attic today, unquote. This one dated just before the police had found him. Dated a day later, mislaid the good butcher knife, unquote. Ruth stretched to reach the lamp atop the dresser. She turned on the light. The fears now lay on the rug in a circle all around her. Patterns emerged in the handwritten little headlines, ozone depletion tied to terminal skin cancer and bisphenol A in plastics 
tied to testicular cancer, causal effect, her father would call it. <laughs> Unbalanced, possibly schizophrenic bag boy at the market, tied to missing cat, tied to noises in the attic, tied to father found dead from an apparent fall down the basement stairs. Ruth smiled over how her father must have spooked himself, how he would have sat here gloating over all the impending ice ages and rising sea levels and atomic bombs and sarin gas and coronaviruses that had gone to someone else's house instead. Her father had listened to the house tick, the clock in the hallway tick, and he'd cracked his knuckles to echo the window frames cooling in the sunset, and not the next earthquake, or the next earthquake, or the next would be the big one that would tip everything sideways and tumble them all into the ocean. And Ruth felt his smug pride. She looked at the time on her phone. If he was still alive, her father would write, electromagnetic radiation from cell phones will kill us all and today's date. The time was 8.32, later than she would have guessed. Among the last pages she opened, she read, quote, there is no God, we will not be reunited, nothing comes after, unquote. This one dated the day that he had fallen down the stairs, maybe. The medical examiner had been really hard to pin down. Here would be her father's, here would be her father's legacy to her, while other people had stampeded around, raving about genetically engineered corn and spontaneous hive collapse tied to crop failures and famine. Her father, her father had remained serene. He had not joined the chicken little and the turkey lurkey crowd and screamed about the sky always falling. The sky wasn't falling. Ruth listened to the sounds of her father's house, harmless sounds of the house settling around her. She was her father's child, a stoic. To embrace this fact, to embrace it, it brought her a calm, sweet certainty that she would never, ever lose her head. Among the last notes she read, she read another fear, quote, Ruthie will never, ever appreciate how much I love her, unquote. She pressed the paper flat on the rug kneeling there in the, in the circle of light from the lamp. The words weren't written in her father's hairy cursive. These belonged, these words belonged to a stranger. And she looked at them for a long time until behind her, she heard the doorknob turn. She heard the hinges squeak and the bedroom door began to drift open. So that was the prophecy of Ruth. Unmute. All right. That is a great and terrifying story. <laughs> <laughs> really, Remember ghost think, stories? Yeah. Ghost stories and campfire stories? Yes. I want stories to scare us like they did when we were little. Just that fantastic terror. It was so amazing. Well, that's the classic the the call pants coming terror. from inside the house, right? One more time. It's the classic, the phone calls coming from inside the house. Yeah. Type of, type of ending, yeah. It was the note about the cat that got me. <laughs> What about a uh, few more questions before we call it sure. a night or? Sure. 
So what made you do that as a short story instead of uh, a novel? There's enough story there for a novel, but the, the story reminds me of a song because every now and then I'll listen to a song, a narrative song that's about four minutes long and contains the, the entirety uh, of a 300, what, what could be a 300 page story. It, um, I'm a fan of Jason Isbell and a lot of his story, a lot of his songs remind me of that, like Speed Trap Town could be a novel. So you, you could have done this as a much longer piece. Why did you choose such a compact form for this particular story? You know, I think a part of it comes from, I come from, you know, my childhood was the, the era of the ballad. And you turned on the radio, you got uh, uh, the night, the lights went out in Georgia, you got uh, Delta Dawn, you got uh, Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, you got Jim Croce, you got ballads, you got Taxi Driver, you got Bad Boy Leroy Brown. Every popular song was a ballad that told a story. And it was kind of a wonderful bridge between folk music and rock music. And so I grew up, you know, memorizing these ballads. American Pie was kind of a ballad. And, uh, and so I thought if a story doesn't need to be 300 pages, if it can just be six pages, that was six pages, then that's what it should be. So did Invention of Sound start as dual narratives or um, did, did, did one of those main characters pop up later? No, it was always uh, dual narratives, but I pretty soon I, I realized that I needed occasional kind of a nonfiction uh, a device inserted. Like in, uh, in uh, Stephen King's book, Carrie, we have I Am Sue Snell, the autobiography of Sue Snell, the sole survivor of prom night. And so the Sue Snell allows people to, allows the story to talk in a very uh, explicit uh, way about what's happening. It's not really a narrative voice. It's, it's very uh, expository and it's after the fact. And so I needed that. And in Invention of Sound, I got that by creating excerpts from the bi biography, autobiography of the actress, so the movie star. And so she's just sort of popped in almost as comic relief, but also to, as a kind of sorbet to help pace the other two narratives. She, she's a, quite an invention. You know, if I could start all over again, my pen name would be Blush Gentry. And I write <laughs> nothing but romances. It's, it's still out there. You know, it's, it's kind of yours. You can... Although we'd all know it was you now. Exactly, yes. That is hilarious. Ah, no, yeah. blush gentry is mine. <laughs> you do not know any blush gentries. You could do a blush gentry book, though. Can I send you another penguin or a dog? I have so many penguins. <laughs> The uh, tattoos, or a guy down the street did those tattoos, of one of my neighbors. Don't send me stuff, please. That doesn't work. I can send you stuff, that's the rule, but you can't send me stuff. Nothing. Uh. <laughs> yes, I sent you stuff, what did I send you? You don't, don't send me shit, okay? <laughs> me sending you shit works because it's going out. A bunch of stuff coming in does not work. <laughs> yes, bookmarks, necklaces, yes. And I made those. And you tore up the packages, didn't you? You tore up those really beautiful packages. I've got 16 arms left. Where did that idea come from? That came because uh, people had asked me to write, uh, to autograph their arm. And I'd come through a, a year or two years later and they would have it tattooed. And I found that really troubling. So I started just, I would spend the whole winter writing, tattooing, autographing hundreds and hundreds of arms. And then at the end of book events, like at Tippy Tina's, we could bring the bookseller up 
and we could say, has Amazon ever done this? Has Amazon ever done this? Well, Britain has done this. Garden District has done this for you. And if you give Garden District a big enough hand, we'll give you a big hand. And the audience would have to applaud the bookseller. And then we dump out these huge cases full of sometimes hundreds of arms and we would throw them into the crowd. And it was just a big pun and a great way to end every evening. And now you can never stop doing it. I have to stop. I can't, my source went out of business. <laughs> Not to be political, but the Chinese tariffs killed my uh, importer. So oh. my importer can't get those arms anymore. So heartbreaking. Oh yeah, put your, just put your address up there. Yeah, that'll do it. Uh, we're gonna have a, a, a tweet coming up as soon as things calm down. Uh, a tweet about how to get Christmas presents to certain people. And if you've got somebody who really was above and beyond during this whole lockdown bullshit thing, there will be a chance for you to get a fantastic Christmas present for them. That's but great. bear in mind, I'll only have about 250 of these fantastic Christmas presents. And I'm going to get it started early so that you get them by Christmas. Don't put your address up there. That's not going to work. Wait for the tweet, OK? Ah, I'm not on Twitter. Sorry. Anyway, please, go ahead. Oh, let's see. Um, people want to write you letters. You should have an Etsy shop. Everybody loves you. I had a heart transplant. Would you sign my heart? No. <laughs> I, I figured that was a no, but I wanted to my ask. My hand to my bandage. Recycling. A tuna, tuna fish can sliced my hand. So I recycle. I knew it was so hazardous. Lullaby movie. Whoa. I still believe in Andy. I still want to see the movie made. But I want Andy to explain what he spent the money on. It's been five years. So if Andy could do a little accounting, I think he'll make everybody happy. And thank you for being a backer. Uh, yeah. Oh, do you, um, so you mentioned earlier that you have a bunch of stuff in the uh, TV slash movie pipeline. Do you do any of the screenwriting? Only for entirely new projects. I pitched a, uh, uh, a new anthology series that Apple gave me a development deal on. They didn't ultimately buy it because anthology seems to be the new dead thing. Every anthology thing has failed. Uh, so now everyone is asking for scripted podcasts. So I'm now doing a scripted podcast, multiple character, basically kind of a radio play. Uh, and we're taking that to market. Gotcha. Is, is that something you'd be interested in in the future, screenwriting? Does that appeal to you? Yeah, it does. Just because, you know, it's, it's working a different set of muscles, especially if it was something like scripted podcast where the episodes are only 20 minutes long uh, and it, they could be really over the top. So that's got to be a real challenge, a 20 minute window. Uh, you yeah. know, I find it's harder to fill an hour for me than to fill 20 minutes. I'd rather have a really dense, intense 20 minutes than, a, than an hour that feels like it's just kind of full of air. Oh, that's a good question. What will the name of the podcast be so people can find it when it's up and running? The working title is The C Team. S-E-A or like C? C? Like the letter C. Like instead of the A not Team, the A it's team, the C Team. Not the B Team, the C it's Team. It's the C Team. And you can make that C stand for anything you want. <laughs> there, you, there you go. So would you talk a little bit about um, working with David Fincher? We've had some questions about that. Or uh, did you work with him or, or what was that relationship like if there was one? You know, I, I, I got to respect Fincher's genius. 
You know, Gene, David is a devoted, hard-headed guy, and he knows what he's looking for. And I was, I think I was bright enough just to stand by his side and nod and say, I think that sounds good. Uh, and he came to me this summer with a project and I helped him with it. And so I'm, I'm hoping that we'll be working again soon on something even bigger. And again, that would be the screenwriting thing would be something you started from scratch or, or a new project that was brought to you and that wouldn't be an adaption of something you've already written. Right. Yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to scotch it. it. Yeah. <laughs> David is reading it right now. So. Yeah. Right. Which is probably the only reason he's not in the zoom meeting right now. If you could write for a comic book, which comic book would you like to write? I, I would really love to write for those old uh, EC comics, you know, creepy, uh, that, that were always kind of a cautionary tale, where, you know, where somebody did a transgression, basically what Creep Show is based on. Oh, yeah. Uh, don't go yeah, ahead. because they were sexy and they were gross yeah. and they and they were always kind of spiritually affirmative because even if somebody came back from the dead that proved that there was an afterlife, it kind of proved a heaven and a hell. It kind of proved a, a spirituality in a way. So I think they, they hit on a lot of different cylinders. Inevitably, do you believe in an afterlife? I do, but I, I don't think it's really appropriate to talk about it because I think it's all supposition. I am a romantic. I'm a, you, if you've seen my packages, you know I am a romantic, okay? And I do want to give out a, a, a shout out to the people who dressed up like grocery clerks for the reading of that story. There are a few of them. I encouraged it uh, on Monday night without saying why. Uh, and a couple of people did take us up on it to maybe add another eerie element to the reading of the story. Grocery clerks with butcher knives. <laughs> So we, we appreciate everyone who cosplayed for this. All right. We will do a real event as soon as the world allows. I had tickets like crazy all over this country. I had tickets to New Orleans that I still, you know, I still have the, the travel credit. So yeah, it will happen again. And it will be a big fun thing again. And I will bring friends and we'll make a mess. We look forward to it. Thank you. It's great. Well, it's been about two hours now. So uh, I think maybe we could call it an evening. Uh, we will uh, be sending out the people who won the prizes. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if we want to do a quick reading of who won the prizes or because there's 21 things, so it's a, it would take a while to get through that. But um, I have already emailed the people who uh, who won the prizes that Chuck is providing from, from his house that he'll be sending out. Uh, and I will very shortly be emailing the, the other 16 people who won things that we'll be shipping out from the bookstore. Oh, uh, uh, Britton? Yes. I've got some more coloring books if you want to give out a half dozen more things, okay. I can I can meet the demand. So all right, I will do another of, ran, random generated you know numbers and get six more winners. It'll it'll get get them out of my office. Give them all happy <laughs> homes. All right. Oh, somebody never wins anything. How can you not choose them? <laughs> happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> uh, so, Britton, are you going to take us out? I am. So, everyone, thanks so much for joining us tonight. It was really an enlightening evening. Uh, great discussions, Bill and Chuck. 
Um, we do we do have uh, a small you know limited amount of signed copies of the new book still available. If people need books for gifts uh, or need another copy to you know for themselves, um, please give us a drop us an email or give us a call, and we'll be happy to provide uh, more signed copies. And this uh, as soon as this. Um, Usually takes us a couple of days to get the video up on our YouTube channel, but uh, if you do, you know, we can go ahead and Google that uh, Garden District, you know, bookshop YouTube. And when you're on YouTube, you should be able to find it. Or if you want to drop us an email, we'll add you to the list of people that we're sending out that uh, that exact link that will bring you to the recording of this event. So thank you, thank you, thank you, and I uh, really appreciate uh, everyone's patience. Yes. Uh, it, was, thank you. it was a struggle getting us. Chuck, thank you especially for working with us to get. <laughs> oh my uh, gosh. This is one for the records. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. so, everyone, good night. God bless. Stay safe. Good night, everyone. Look for the Christmas tweet coming up soon. Okay. All, All right. right. Good night. Good night. Good night, y'all.